I always love to take the opportunity to give the big picture of public health, especially on the local level, um, to point out that as a local public health department, we serve the five counties in southwestern Utah. That contains the, I think, 250,000 plus and growing population that we have. We become a very popular destination, not only for tourism and, and, and visiting to recreate, but a lot of people have discovered southwestern Utah and, and all the charms that we offer and are relocating here, which is wonderful. And so for the foreseeable future, we will probably have robust growth as far as population. And we are a population-based intervention type of an, an agency. A lot of what we do is prevention versus intervention, although we are involved in both. And our motto is to protect the health of the community through the promotion of wellness and the prevention of disease. We do that through over 80 programs that we administer in four divisions in our five-county office. And those divisions include community health, environmental health, emergency preparedness and response, and then our clinical or nursing division, which, which has a lot of programs under it, including vital records. Any one of those divisions on its own uh, has a lot of unique things about it. And so under the umbrella of public health, we administer a lot of a great variety and diversity of programs, but most of them are community and population based where we try to do the best we can for the biggest number of people to try to keep things in a safe way that really, if they're going well, you probably don't really know they're going well or why. And so the kind of our joke is every time you go to a restaurant and don't get food poisoning uh, or, or get ill in some way from our drinking water systems, uh, you know, people don't think to, to be grateful for that. It's just how we live until something goes wrong. If there is a boil order put out by a county because of a, a drinking water disruption, if there's a septic tank issue, if there's a food poisoning outbreak in a restaurant, or on a larger scale, a pandemic like the COVID-19 pandemic that we're sort of on the tail end of right now, even though we don't know exactly how that's going to resolve, mm -hmm. that's where public health is involved in, in trying to administer programs that prevent those things from happening. And then if they do pop up, how to... Uh, head them off at the pass as soon as possible to make sure there's not a, a lot of unnecessary damage. Speaking of COVID, what is the latest? So the latest is that we have now gone from a daily report of local COVID-19 activity to a weekly report to now just a general weekly report on public health issues that might include COVID-19 updates. And really the, the update is uh, not a big change in a good way. We've shifted over to the Centers for Disease Control, local county transmission tool. And so you can Google that CDC County COVID-19. We have a link to it on our website, which is SWUHealth.org. And we'll repeat that another couple of times during the program. But if you click that link and put in your state and county, then you're able to see the COVID transmission level, which is a figure that's uh, brought together through uh, positive testing, hospitalizations, and altogether kind of shows the current risk of COVID-19 in your community. All five of our counties which are Washington, Iron, Beaver, Kane, and Garfield, have remained at low transmission level for weeks. And so that's good news. And so on a Very weekly exciting. basis, yeah, every Thursday afternoon when, when we put out our weekly public health report for the community, um, which is currently on our social media accounts, Facebook and Instagram, under SWU Health, or search for Southwest Utah Public Health Department on those platforms. We're also linked into Twitter. I think you told me earlier we have a YouTube page. And so we're trying to use every way that we can to get accurate, timely information out to the public. And so on our weekly reports, that's all we've really had to say as far as COVID-19 activity, that the rate is low. And that means that the hospitals have had a, a wonderful breather for several weeks, a couple of months after being overrun and, and maxed past normal capacity for a couple of years. So it's good news for them. It's good news generally for our health. What's happened is the COVID-19 variant that's now predominant is mm -hmm. uh, simply not as harmful as previous variants have been. We also have a large number of people who've been vaccinated. Most people eligible people have been vaccinated in Utah. Uh, okay. Not as much as maybe we'd like, maybe 65 to 68 percent of okay. people in Utah have been vaccinated. You said that are eligible. So tell us who's eligible and where we're at with boosters. One thing we did announce in our weekly, our, our most recent public health report is that uh, vaccines have been approved even at a lower and lower age. Okay. And so ages 5 to 12 have been approved at this point. And I think even for a booster. And so now anybody over age five can get vaccinated, number one, and then five months after their last vaccine series, which is a two-shot series of Moderna or Pfizer or the current ones that we're recommending, they can get another booster of either brand five months after. 
and that will give them uh, as maximum protection as far as vaccine goes. We are expecting a possible recommendation for a booster in the fall as cold and flu season began to uh, come back around, and we don't know what role yet COVID-19 will play in that. It's currently circulating and may continue to circulate. A lot of common colds are coronaviruses. And so uh, COVID-19 is a coronavirus, and it's following the pattern that we expected from the beginning, that after a couple of years, enough immunity is built up naturally and then also moved along quicker by a vaccine program until it becomes more like a common cold, not something quite as deadly to be worried about like a new pandemic where a lot of people don't have immunity. It has taken quite a toll in our community. People that at first thought, well, this is just the flu or it's another common cold or it's no big deal, and they would say, well, the, the survival rate's still pretty good. It doesn't have over a 1% mortality rate. Well, that may be true, but, you know, 1%, even a little under 1%, that's still a lot of people. We've lost over 600 residents to COVID-19 in the past two years in southwestern Utah alone. Most of those folks were under risk categories like being over age 65 or having underlying health conditions, and the vast majority of them would still be with us if it weren't for COVID-19. These are the same people that are typically vulnerable to risk of health complications or even death from things like influenza or pneumonia. COVID-19 was a new novel virus that kicked in and sort of edged those other seasonal diseases out of the way as, as it took a, an unfortunate toll in our community over the past couple of years. So the bright spot now is that we're seeing far less people in the hospital, a flat mortality rate where there still is an occasional person who is losing their life and most of them have underlying health conditions that do make them vulnerable. So COVID-19 has an impact, but it's it's, it's quite low and manageable compared to what it was originally. Moving forward, what is on the horizon for public health? What is the big focus right now? It's hard to say what our focus is when you have so many programs that you're trying to, <laughs> to watch over. But one of them is, is, is our mission statement in the prevention of disease uh, is an on, ongoing things that we did before COVID-19, our immunization program. And so that's where we offer a wide variety, uh, variety of immunizations for not only the recommended ones based on from infancy up until school age kids where the, there's recommendations and, and even uh, requirements once you go into kindergarten and then again as your child goes into seventh grade there are uh, Utah state school requirements for getting vaccine unless you get an exemption which are possible and Utah doesn't it doesn't really care why you want an exemption it's just a personal exemption there aren't many actual religious exemptions that qualify as far as vaccine goes there's very few religions that actually teach against vaccination, but all you need to do in Utah is have a personal reason, which basically could be, I'd rather not get my kid vaccinated. That's good enough. Um, it doesn't cost anything anymore. You can do that online and it's good throughout the state. Now, the caveat to that is if uh, in your child's school, there is an outbreak of that disease through a, a vaccine preventable uh, a disease, such as chicken pox, whooping cough, um, measles, anything along those lines, then your child is required to be exempted and stay home until that outbreak is over, which can be anywhere from a few days to a couple of months. If you do want to exempt your child from getting vaccinated and still have them go to the public school system, just be aware that if there is one of those outbreaks, which fortunately don't happen too often because, frankly, because of the vaccine program we have in developed nations, uh, then they will need to be exempted during that period of time. So that's currently how we administer the vaccine program in Utah. Utah is one of those states where you have some choice there. Uh, most most parents get their kids vaccinated. We recommend that you do it on the on the regular schedule. They can sometimes get several shots at once. So far, that's proven to be, you know, safe and effective. After effects from vaccines are pretty rare. Uh, the most common ones would be, will be soreness or, or irritation at the site of the injection. Sometimes some minor fever-like or achy symptoms for a couple of days as the vaccine builds up immunity in your system. But far more adverse vaccine effects are, are very rare. And the good that vaccines do as far as preventing disease and death so far have far outweigh any, any potential side effects of the vaccine itself. In addition, I'm just thinking um, big picture, national news, myth busters or... <laughs> yeah, those are always fun. And, and with, <laughs> with public health, and frankly, because we're so good now, even as an mm -hmm. international community at detecting disease, yes. epidemiology and surveillance programs, even since COVID-19, we've had the, the mysterious childhood hepatitis illness that has gone international and in fact has affected kids in in United States enough to where some have had to have liver transplants. There's been a few kids internationally that have lost their lives to it. So it's mm -hmm. a serious but rare disease. We do have, I think, a couple of cases that have occurred in Utah. They're still trying to figure out what caused it. Um, it may be COVID linked as far as maybe some kids actually because of isolation or quarantine, having their immune systems drop a little bit to make them more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, some people think, well, is it a side effect of long COVID? People that caught the disease and are having health issues, they don't know for sure yet what it is. Sure. All they know that it seems to be, it, it looks like it's above what normal levels of hepatitis in, in pediatric population seems to be. And so that's being monitored very closely. Um, but the recommendation currently is there's no reason for general alarm at all among parents. It's still extremely rare. Uh, if your child happens to have uh, you know, a fever and body aches that it would appear like a flu or a cold or COVID-19, but are having itchy skin, uh, yellowing of the skin and eyes that look kind of like jaundice that indicates yes. a, a hepatitis-like or possible liver-like illness, then you definitely want to take them into your health care provider. But other than that, uh, other than being aware and being aware that public health is monitoring the situation, that's a very low-risk situation right now for, for the vast majority of the population. So the past couple of weeks, that's been replaced by monkeypox. Monkey Which, uh, and I think what's happened is very interesting. 2020 was the year that everyone thought was, it, it got almost uh, uh, darkly humorous, almost like a, what else could happen everywhere from COVID-19 to civil unrest to murder hornets. You know, what happened to those, right? Yes, <laughs> I remember. <laughs> and, and then the joke was, well, it wasn't like those things were going to magically go away last year in 2021. Mm-hmm. And in 2022, people have almost become almost taken for granted that as, as these new potentially dangerous or life affecting things come up, there's this dark humor of, Oh, what's next. Right. Uh, right. Well, you know, it's about time. We're just waiting for the next shoe <laughs> to drop. But, but frankly, what it comes from is the world, you know, mortality has always had things that go on in the world that are adverse or, or have an element of risk. We become very good at detecting those and we're an international community and the media also through the normal channels and through social media, people are instantly alerted to those type of things, which in one way is good. On the other hand, sometimes those things can be exaggerated or misinterpreted. And so uh, one thing we want to caution people about, if you hear of a a mystery hepatitis in children or you hear about the monkeypox outbreaks, sometimes certain media channels can make those seem more risky than they really are. And so we just want to hope that people will get educated, get accurate information to be able to determine personally what your risk actually is. Nothing is Mm -hmm. risk-free. That's part of life. But there's also something to living optimistically and realizing that, you know, for the most part, we need to go on with life, but use wise precautions against disease, but no need to go overboard. And I think COVID-19 really brought that out of extremes on both sides, extremes of being extremely careless and not caring to the other end of being overly caring. Uh, when you look at extreme lockdowns and, and positions placed that actually in some ways did more harm than good. So hopefully that will be a teaching lesson for us moving forward. Utah was the state that came out on top out of all 50 states. So feel fortunate that you live here, that you've just moved here, because uh, as far as COVID-19 is concerned, an economic survey and research found that Utah handled COVID-19 the best in the most balanced way. So there's uh, one of the, our health department's unofficial models is moderation in all things. You can take anything to the extreme. Uh, Dr. Blodgett, our health officer and director here in southwestern Utah, from the very beginning of the declaration of the pandemic, set a course to be moderate to be very careful, to be wise, and not to be just reactive, especially if we had unknown information. Unfortunately, a lot of the planning we had done for any pandemic for decades before on a large scale, even nationally, were sort of thrown out the window. A lot of it was responding to unknown information. It became political really quickly. And so, again, it wasn't perfect anywhere. But if you want to live somewhere, in my opinion, Utah was the place to be, and especially in southern Utah, where the, the powers that be here over um, over public health and those type of decisions with mandates and vaccines and everything like that were held quite moderately, which meant that we took a beating from all ends. And so we probably offended all of you <laughs> one way or the <laughs> other. <it> Either we <laughs> were doing too much or too little. We, yeah. we supported the state mandates, but we decided early on we would have none of our own local mandates that would exceed the states. We didn't have the appetite here at, down here as far as law enforcement was concerned or, or public health. And, and even though some people really thought we should have done more and should have had heavier lockdowns. It's been shown that severe long-term lockdowns did more harm than good. There, there's no getting around it. States that really made that their recipe for responding to the pandemic <clears throat> didn't do as well as Utah. And areas of the world that had long-term strict lockdowns, even though they were able to hold the disease off for a year or two, they're now having their surges. Diseases like this do what they're going to do. They have a, a natural way that they, they move. We, uh, we can protect ourselves uh, through masking and vaccine. Neither of them are perfect, but they offer a protective factor. So I think ending lockdowns sooner, like we did in Utah, we had an initial one. Beyond that, I think there was a good balance that allowed our economy to remain stronger than other states, to recover quicker. 
we uh, this the survey found that any of our measures didn't cost extra lives. So actually, some measures implemented by other states cost lives rather than save them. As far as COVID nineteen, again, nothing's perfect, and there's you know room for criticism on all sides. But it's it's been really wonderful to be able to see that as as we tried to chart a course through this whole pandemic in, in a careful way. For the most part, it seemed to work for the most people. And again, that's what public health is all about. As we wrap up this session. If anybody wants to hear about more about specific information, about what's going on, what do you recommend that they do? Well, if you want to get alerts as soon as the media does, follow us on social media. So if you have access to Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, then then follow our accounts. It's under SWU Health or Southwest Utah Public Health Department. We have at least daily posts of events. Um, medical counsel and advice along with any alerts as far as any outbreaks or things that might have a risk factor.